sponsors uh, for this bill. This is really the first major step uh, to implement uh, provisions that were suggesting these recommendations that were made in the Attorney General's working group and the report that came back. As you've already heard, when you, when you look at the requirement of high school diploma, GED, there's only, only three states that do not require it. Um, clearly, that, that needs to be changed. That's what bill does. Uh, the second thing the bill does is it lifts the cap. Uh, as a practical matter, what that means is that once the cap is lifted, uh, the Ohio Police Officers Training Commission uh, has the ability uh, to raise the hours in whatever perfect way they, they seem best. Uh, the working group came back and a number of additional things that should be covered uh, in basic police training. Um, the commission will take this matter up uh, next week, and at least we'll start a discussion of it. So I think you can expect uh, the actual numbers for basic training to go up uh, significantly uh, from 605 hours to cover uh, some of the things, many of the things that were contained in, in the report. As has also been said, uh, this is just the beginning. Not cover the continuing training, uh, which is also a major area for Ohio, uh, ranks 37 uh, of all the states in the continuing training required. Uh, we fall well below uh, our neighbors, uh, continue to go to states, uh, and frankly, that's going to have to be, have to be dealt with. But this is a great, great first uh, step, and I congratulate uh, the leaders uh, for taking the lead and food so forth. Could one of you say how many hours of basic training there should be in Ohio? Well, um, I think I simply say that the need to see that we've increased from 605. Then you're dealing with two things. You're dealing with one, the number of hours, uh, which will be dealt with by the Ohio Police Office Training Commission. Uh, Second is what is covering that training. Third is the quality of the training. So the commission will look at all, all of these matters and they will start uh, in the next few days to do that, the next meeting to the public. To the uh, legislative leaders, have uh, you discussed uh, money for continuing training hours? I know money has been raised as a major obstacle to this um, could be a lot of money. How much have you talked about that? Yeah, I think that's why the attorney, this is, look, this is the first step in, a, in the process here. We're taking an opportunity to look at uh, both of what's going on, plus you know, the governor has his executive order, and so uh, we're just making sure we take the right steps and the right uh, the right, right process here. And so what we'll do is spend time with President Faber and his team and continue to talk about avenues to which we can do this, but I think there's also a question of how do we get there and what does it all look like and still having that conversation. Uh, exactly what the speaker just mentioned is where we're at. We're taking a look at it. Uh, the budget's currently over in the Senate. Uh, one of the things we look for ways to do is to figure out ways to help communities, particularly local government communities that need some extra assistance. Um, and frankly, it's not one size fits all for uh, Some of the bigger cities have so much different issues than some of the smaller communities on their taxes. So when you're dealing with the sheriff's department that we heard about earlier, uh, just had a couple of members, a couple of staff, and when you free somebody up to go continue their education is a true financial hardship. Uh, we're looking at providing some assistance for those types of communities. But as we look at this, certainly we realize some additional assistance may be necessary. When it comes to requiring that continuing education, would that come from the training commission or would that come from legislative changes? It can come from either. The fact is, though, that um, the Ohio Police Officers Training Commission cannot really effectively act without money. Uh, so that decision is going to have to be made uh, by the legislature uh, long ago. That's, that's where those decisions are going to have to be made. Uh, the commission uh, you know, has no real ability to make the required hours, but uh, the current law, for example, Hours, additional hours are required, or many hours are required, they have to be paid for uh, on reimbursement based at $20 per hour per officer. Uh, so that's that's what is in, in current current law law today. What we have today 
date on it, no thought down explicitly about continuing the training. Whatever the requirement is, four hours. Uh, the way the four hours came about is that was the money uh, that was available um, from the casinos. Uh, half the money was available from the casinos, so we had put towards those four hours. So that's what I think. Again, you can't, you can't do it without the money. Do you have an idea of how many? This is any officer who does not have a GED or, or a high school diploma uh, is simply a grandfather in this point. This is talking about people who are going to get in the future. But frankly, I, I would guess there's a very, very few who still will not. The questions? Mr. Attorney General, is it over here? How much will this have? Well, I think if you look at the recommendations, and this is the first step in building those recommendations, um, we owe it to every police officer in the state to make sure that police officer has not only adequate initial training, but continuing training every single year. Uh, the skills that we're talking about are perishable skills. Uh, skill that to confront a dangerous situation um, is something that you can't just learn in a book, or you can't just learn at one time and then, and then not have to use it for many, many years. Uh, it just doesn't work that way. The skills are, are perishable. So it's vitally important for safety of police officers for them to have uh, not only additional continuing training, but the right kind of additional training. It's equally important for members of the public that they, whether they live in a village, whether they live in a township, uh, or they live in a big city, they have their same rights as every other Ohio citizen. We have police officers in that community uh, be highly trained and continue to be trained. Uh, one of the emphasis of the, uh, the working group, the working group is talking about uniformity uh, in the training of police officers. We expect this so to be an, you expect this to be enacted before summer break? I, I absolutely do, and we'll continue to work with uh, President Faber uh, on this issue, and I know I can anticipate the President is going to drop some more legislation in the Senate. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> if you lift the 650-hour uh, training cap, uh, do you anticipate a lot of academies will go beyond that? Well, some are uh, and, and certainly some of the closed academies that uh, bigger police departments have uh, already built on that. So, certainly could, what we're mostly concerned about though is having, making sure every police officer in the state who is being trained, every person who's being trained to become a police officer has to requisite amount of hours. And I think it's, it's, it's clear that 605 is not enough. It's going to be a significant increase over that. I wouldn't want to forget what the uh, Ohio Police Officer Training Commission will do, but I think it would be significantly beyond 605 hours. So just to clarify, what this would do was would lift a cap that's in, legis in the revised code now. That would allow OPATA to set a new mandatory minimum number of hours, is that correct? Correct. So we don't know what that is, and you've already explained why we don't want to put a number on it. But presumably once this legislation passes and then OPATA uh, meets and votes, down the road they will set a minimum, a new minimum hour that could be whatever, 705, 805, and every academy would have to follow that? That's correct. That's correct. That's not, that's not different than the way the system works today. It's the same. Same, only there's, there's that cap. Is there a reason why the, the legislature can't set the cap in consultation with OPATA and law enforcement people? Uh, the legislature could do that. Uh, let the uh, speaker and the Senate president tell you why that's probably not a good idea. Right? Yeah, they could do it. You don't want the legislature to do that. You want the legislature to set ground rules and let the people with expertise and knowledge 
who can adjust to changing circumstances. Do that. Um, and, and from our perspective, look, adequate training, and I would say exceptional training, is as important to the safety of our officers as uh, bulletproof vests or a gun or a safe crew. <coughs> it's also as important to our citizens. And so that's what we're here to discuss is what is not just adequate, but I would say exceptional. Um, Attorney General DeWine has, uh, frankly, in the services of Attorney General, been an exceptional Attorney General. We want to make sure that they have the controls and the authority to set forth what those training standards are going to be in a way that improves all the lives. And so that's why we're looking at these things. And I think it's going to grow up funding. Funding is uh, certainly going to have to be part of that discussion. Thanks for coming. As a, as a follow-up, 